thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Xin Yu. I know it's really hard to pronounce it. A name star with the X. So people recommend to go with last name. And fortunately, my last name also start from X. <laughs> so today I'll be talking about uh, Palm. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Jin Xu, Dong Liang Mu, and my colleague from Penn State, Peng Liu, Ping Chen, and Bing Mao from Nanjing University. Okay. Uh, despite intensive in-house uh, software testing, program invariably contains defects. And those defects can cause software terminate accidentally and sometimes crash at post-deployment stages. According to a recent study, software debugging can cost a lot of money. Uh, for example, in a report a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, a crash, uh, a software debugging cost 312 billion U.S. dollar globally, and software developers usually spend 15% of their time in finding a bug or fixing a problem defect. To address this problem, a lot of work has been proposed to make software debugging easier and efficient. So for example, uh, those techniques including the heavyweight solution, such as record and replay, and some lightweight techniques, such as examining stack trace in debugger, auditing execution log, and even analyzing the crash, uh, crash dump. So, as I summarize in this table, technique proposed have different costs and capability. For the heavyweight technique, such as record replay, it needs to trace the program execution and log the program status. So it's usually introduced high overhead, but program execution trace and program status are super useful for software developer to find vulnerabilities or some other bugs. As a result, they are very, very efficient. The lightweight solution does not require program tracing and program status logging, so it nearly has no overhead. But the lack of program tracing and logging usually cause the problem, which is those techniques usually have a very limited power in finding a software bug. In this talk, I'll be talking about a new technique to facilitate software debugging. And the ultimate goal of this research is to make software debugging automatic, accurate, and more importantly, uh, overhead free. And this non-intrusive characteristic is so important because the running overhead is, the, is, is nearly an untouchable bottom line for most of the software in the post-deployment stages. Our technique is called POM. The basic idea of POM is to use a software crash report and also sometimes called core dump to diagnose software failures. A, a, a crash report uh, usually is created only when the program accidentally terminated. Therefore, it introduces no overhead at a running, uh, uh, to a running software. In general, a core dump carries the following information, memory snapshot, register information, and some other signal information. However, according to a recent study, those information provide uh, only a partial chronology of how program reach a crash site. Therefore, it is barely used as a source for software for automatic software debugging. In this work, we enhance core dump with Intel Processor Tracer. An Intel Processor Tracer is a new hardware feature provided by new generation of, uh, of CPUs. With this uh, Intel processor tracer, we can trace the program execution and integrate execution trees into a conventional core dump with nearly no overhead. As we can see from this picture, with the help of processor tracer, we can not only extract the crashing state, but more importantly, easily capture the control flow of a crashing program. In the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about how we use enhanced core dump to automate software failure diagnosis. What is the challenge? And how are we going to address those challenges in our design? Following that, I'll talk about how we, how we evaluate our system in the real world crashes. And finally, I will conclude our work. Before I introduce our work, let's take a look at how software developers debug a crashing program. This is the program snapshot with a non-pointer dereference defect. 
when it gets running, a non pointer was passed and the program will crash at line 19. To identify the root cause of this crash, software developers need to reversely execute how this bad pointer R was actually propagated. In this case, this is quite easy. The non pointer was passed through line 15, 14, line 9, and line 8. And line 8 is the root cause of this program crash. In our work, we developed Pomp to mimic this whole procedure in an automatic manner. In particular, we develop Pomp to first reversely execute an instruction trace starting from the crashing site. Second, using this power, we reconstruct the data flow that the program followed prior to its crash. And finally, using this data flow, we examine how a bad pointer or some bad value was passed to the crash site. Here I will use some example to give you more detail on how we perform reverse execution. To perform reverse execution, ideally, we want to invert the operation of each instruction. For example, given those mathematical instructions, we can easily reversely execute each of these instructions by simply inverting the operation of those instructions. For add EAX, we can do EAX minus 10. Uh, sub EAX 216, we can do EAX plus 216. Decrease and increase EAX, we can simply do EAX plus 1, EAX minus 1. For some other instructions like this, a direct inverse operation is nearly impossible. So for example, move EAX 5 will overwrite uh, register EAX and we are not able to easily restore this value by simply inverting this operation, just like what we did with those mathematical instructions. So in this work, we use backward data flow analysis to deal with those non-invertible instructions, like move or X or R. Let's take a look at this example. Assume this is the instruction trace logged and restored using Intel PT. And this is a crashing memory snapshot. Assume we perform reverse execution uh, starting from crashing instruction L5. As I mentioned earlier, this move instruction overrides the value of EBX, and we are not able to directly invert the operation of this instruction. But doing a data flow analysis, we can easily figure out the definition of EBX can reach the crashing instruction without any blocking. This means the value of EBX should it equal to the value of EDX before the, before the execution of L5, instruction L5. Using this knowledge, we can update the memory status and move the program counter backward. Well, this approach is fairly straightforward. However, backward, backward data flow analysis sometimes cannot be as simple as what I just showed you. And this is because of uh, memory aliens issues. Continue this example to reversely execute instruction L4 using data flow analysis, which I just introduced. We might find out before the execution of instruction L4, the ECX is equal to the value uh, in the memory indicated by EDI. So a quick reaction is to retrieve the value of EDI and find the memory cell and assign that value and assign that value to the value of ECX. However, this could be wrong. Back to this example, there is a possibility that these two memory cells might be aliens of each other. Or in other words, EDI probably equals to ECX before the execution of instruction L4. If this is true, the definition of ECX will not be able to reach instruction L4. And we will have to assign the value of EDI to the value of ECX. And this is memory aliens issues. In this work, we address this memory, memory alien issue through hypothesis testing. To be specific, for each pair of memory, we make two hypotheses. One, we assume a pair of memory is not aliens, while the other we assume they are aliens. And then using this hypothesis, we create, uh, sorry, after we have in the hypothesis, we create a uh, data flow, uh, a use-defense chain, 
and extract the constraint under each hypothesis. Using the constraint in each set, we can test each of the hypotheses and decide whether we accept the hypothesis or we, or we reject the hypothesis. To show you more detail on how this hypothesis test actually works, let's come back to this example again. As I mentioned earlier, these two symbolic names might be aliens of each other. So first, we can make two hypotheses. One, we assume these two, member, this two member excess are not aliens, while the other will assume the opposite. After having these two hypotheses, we can construct use different chain. From instruction one, L1, we can indicate the use of EDX, a diff definition of EDX. From the second instruction, we can identify use of EDI, use of a memory cell indicated by EDI, and use of ECX. From the third instruction, we can extract use of ESI, use of ECX, and definition of a memory access indicated by uh, ECX. And finally, from the last instruction, we can have a definition of ECX. Under the first hypothesis, we assume these two symbolic names are not aliens. So we can quickly figure out the use of memory cell indicated by EDI could reach to the instruction of L4 without any blocking. Using this information, we can have a constraint showing in this circle. And in the second hypothesis, we assume these two symbolic names, EDI and ECX, are aliens. So we can quickly figure out the use of this EDI is, is not able to reach the is not able to reach instruction L4 which will be blocked by the definition of memory access indicated by ECX. And we can construct, a, we can extract a constraint based on this use different chain and indicating in this circle. After having this two set of constraint, now we can test the hypothesis using memory status. Let's recall Go our goal is to restore the value of ECX prior to the execution of instruction L4. Under the first hypothesis, EC, we check the first constraint. In this case, ECX should equal to the value of EDI, should equal to the value of memory access indicated by EDI. So what we can do is we can find, retrieve the value uh, of the memory cell indicated by EDI and assign that value to ECX. And after that, after having the value of ECX, we check the second constraint in this set. So in this case, ECX is equal to 22, and the EDI is 45. So apparently, these two values are not equal. So that means the second constraint is valid. After we make sure the second constraint is valid, we go to the third constraint in this set. In this case, we retrieve the value of ECX, and, and find the memory access, the corresponding memory, and compare the, that value with the value of ESI. And in this case, the constraint indicate these two values should equal. However, we can find a conflict using this memory cell, which means the third constraint is invalid, and we should reject the first hypothesis and accept the second hypothesis. With the help from hypothesis test, which I just showed you, it seems that we can perform reverse engineering, re, sorry, reverse execution without any difficulty. However, this is not true. For the example that I show you, we have sufficient evidence to reject or, re, or accept a hypothesis. But in the real world, we may not have enough evidence to reject a hypothesis. When programming is running, its execution might introduce system calls. In our design, we do not trace our, the execution to OS kernel, so we may not be able to perform an accurate data flow analysis. For example, a system call like write and receive could modify any memory region in user space, and we may not be able to know the memory region it will affect. So in this case, our strategy is to treat the system call like receive and write if we are not able to identify uh, the, the memory region they affect 
we will treat them as the definition and assume those definitions will block all the memory access propagation. And this is because a non-deterministic memory, memory region access can potentially overlap with any memory region in user space. In addition to system calls, another limitation of hypothesis test is intensive computation. As I mentioned earlier, when we perform hypothesis tests, we make assumption and then perform data flow analysis. However, sometimes we may not be able to do an accurate data flow analysis if we do not perform uh, the actual hypothesis test. For example, in this case, to determine whether R1 and R2 are aliens or not, we might have to first check whether R3 and R4 are aliens or not. But to determine R3 and R4 are aliens or not, we may have to go back and check whether R1 and R2 are aliens or not. This is called hypothesis test dependent. To deal with this kind of dependency issue, we have to perform reverse uh, recursive hypothesis test. Take this case, for example. The test we, will, uh, we have to perform include four hypotheses. They are R1, R2 are aliens, and R3, R4 are also aliens. R1, R2 are aliens, and R3, R4 are not aliens. R1, R2 not aliens, R3, R4 are aliens. R1, R2 are not aliens, R3, R4 are not aliens either. As, I, as we can imagine, in theory, recursive hypothesis tests like this could potentially introduce a computation complexity to the power n to the power of uh, n to the power of m. N is the number of instruction. M is the number of hypothesis tests each instruction has has to depend on. Here we can clearly see like we definitely don't want this M to be too big. Otherwise, the system that we build based on this algorithm will stuck forever. So to address this issue in our design, we only perform the recursive hypothesis test with a limited number of recursion steps. In our implementation, we set this M equals to two. So as I will show you in the next couple of slides, this setup typically do not influence our technique that much. And we can still use this kind of setting to find the root cause of software crash. With the capability of resolving memory aliens and performing reverse execution, we can easily construct data flow that crashing program follows and use that data flow to pinpoint the instruction that truly contributed to the crash. Here in this table, uh, shows how our technique behave when we use it to analyze real world crashes. As we can see from the table, there are 31 program crashes resulting from uh, real world vulnerabilities. And those vulnerabilities include stack heap integer overflow, use software free, and even non-pointer dereference. In addition, we can also find uh, the crashing program that we test range from sophisticated software like GDB with millions of lines of code to some lightweight software such as core HTTP with only hundreds of lines of code. In the table, we can also see, uh, we also showed the amount of time that each, that our technique takes for analyzing and execution trees. The length of execution trees from the fault point to the crashing site. The amount of instruction that truly contribute to the crash and the amount of instruction that our system believe that contribute to the crash. Here the root cost indicated whether our technique could include the failure root cost from the instruction set indicated by our approach. From this table, first, we can see our technique marks slightly more instruction than the one that truly contributed to the program crash. However, we can also see, compare with the instruction trees that one has to dig through our techniques significantly reduce the amount of instruction that software developer and security analysts need to manually examine. Among all the test cases that we evaluate, our technique can include failure root cause in a small set of instructions, except for two cases. One is airplay, another is overkill. For the airplay, this is because our instruction trees contain a system call. It drives 
a data chunk to a certain memory region, and our reverse execution technology will not be able to determine its location and the size of that memory region. As I mentioned earlier, a system call like this will block all the memory access propagation, which harm the capability of failure diagnosis. For the overheat, overkill, this crash results from an integer overflow. It traps the program into a, a long-term uh, iteration. In our implementation, we only use 22 megabytes of memory uh, space to store execution trees. Therefore, our technique cannot include the root cause instruction into the execution trees that we, install, we, that we restored. Finally, from the table, uh, we can also observe the amount of time for failure diagnosis varies a lot. For most of the cases, our technique takes seconds or tens of minutes, uh, minutes for program failure diagnosis. But for some other cases, it could take several hours to process. This is because for most cases that exhibit longer duration processing time, our technique needs to perform more recursive hypothesis tests than others. And in general, those recursive hypothesis, hypothesis tests uh, take a longer time. To summarize our work, uh, we develop a palm. Um, it can reversely execute a crashing program and restore the memory footprint. And using the footprint that we've restored, we can construct uh, the data flow and diagnose the root cost uh, based on that data flow. With the support of palm, um, software developer and security analyst can analyze any kind of crashes, including those resulting from memory corruption vulnerabilities. It allows the software to examine only a few lines of instruction, which significantly reduces the amount of work that software developer and security analysts need to, need to put. So we, may, we have already made our code available in this repository. You can check and test our software. And thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so we again have time for a few questions. Can you please come to the mic? Thank you. This is Mehdi Karimi from UBC. Um, uh, so I know that there is a similar work that is done in uh, 2008, uh, which is called Backspace uh, at UBC, and Flavio Di Polo and Dr. Allen, who was uh, conducting it. Um, I just want to, okay, so the question here would be, um, have you done any kind of a performance analysis to be able to compare it with a similar work? Um, so first, I, I don't know that work uh, too much, but I know there are some work uh, that definitely also do reverse execution. Like there is one in 2016, last year, from SESE, from Microsoft, um, so they are also doing this kind of reverse execution, but at that time, uh, the Intel PT is not being used. So which means uh, when the, the situation that they are dealing with only have, uh, they only have the memory crash status, but do not have the control flow information. But in our work, uh, we, we, have a depth, we have more information, and this the, most, the major contribution of this work is how do we utilize the control flow information to infer the data flow, that is a major contribution. Uh, I have no idea, sorry, uh, I, I don't know that work that much, um, but uh, I, the, the, on, I, the only comment that I can give is like compare our work with the one that we already know, but I'm happy to, to learn more from you offline. Thank you. Zhu uh, Yunqian from UC Riverside. Um, so I have a quick question about the trace that you collect. Can you actually know um, the, uh, like, can you know which instruction, um, can you map the, the instruction in the trace to um, the binary that you're, you're executing? And if so, can you do static analysis to rule out impossible aliases ahead of time to optimize your um, uh, recursive um, hypothesis testing? Um, so we can definitely map the instruction that we extract from processor tracer uh, to, the, to, the, to the binary code uh, without any problem. Um, uh, but definitely you can also do uh, static analysis to rule out all the uh, aliens, uh, memory aliens. 
But for example, you can use like the, uh, the value set analysis. Um, but unfortunately, we have some comparison before we, con uh, we conduct this research. The value set analysis static way, we are not able to, the accuracy is really, really bad. So using that kind of approach, we basically, there are a lot of false positive. Um, so that basically means if we use that technology to, to tend those instructions that truly contribute to a crash, there, are, there will be more instruction we have, we, will, we have to pen, they have to tend. That is disaster for the software developer to finding the, the, the vulnerabilities. Right, I, I was just think, thinking that you can use it to rule out impossible aliases to reduce your search space in some sense. That's possible. Uh, if we can combine uh, the existing technology with the one that we propose, we can definitely make these things faster. That's a very good suggestion. Okay, and one quick question from... Okay, then go first. Sorry, go ahead. No. Sorry. Hi, uh, Bhargava from T Berlin. So, uh, what support do applications that are already deployed need to use Intel tracing? Can you say that again? Sorry. So, uh, let's say a software is deployed, and I want to make use of this idea. Uh, do I need to compile my application differently to use PT, or how does it work? Oh, I see. So, um, so you don't need to recompile your application. So, uh, everything is built uh, inside of a kernel. Um, so as long as you are, uh, I know like uh, operating system is already support, like after PT come up, operating system is already support. When you do the program is crash, uh, so they can integrate those uh, executing traces into uh, the, the, the crash down. So you don't need to basically do any re-engineering work on your application. Okay, and then one quick question from my side. Um, for, let's say, the double fetch vulnerabilities we heard earlier, or for let's say data only attacks, you don't, you, know, you cannot identify the root cause, right? Uh, we, we we didn't test our software against those kind of vulnerabilities, um, but I can tell you what kind of vulnerability we are not able to handle. So for the program, uh, for for a vulnerability, um, for a software crash which is uh, caused by, for example, like uh, two two threads. Uh, those kind of application the vulnerability we have difficulty to handle. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's thank the speaker.